Georgia voting rights, banking the unbanked, not, and a hit songwriter. These are today's stories, and this is The Normal Show. Buongiorno, sono Marco Michieli. In Georgia, negli Stati Uniti, i repubblicani hanno approvato una legge che rende più difficile il voto, aggiungendo numerose restrizioni e complicazioni per i cittadini. E il caso dello Stato del Sud non è isolato. Anzi, questo è The Normal Show. La nuova legge, che regola le elezioni dello Stato della Georgia, ha provocato numerose reazioni politiche, con una dura denuncia da parte del Presidente Joe Biden e le critiche di molte corporations. Ha anche spinto le associazioni per i diritti civili a intraprendere delle azioni legali. La Georgia è uno Stato a guida repubblicana, ma alle scorse elezioni presidenziali i democratici hanno vinto lo Stato e conquistato anche i due seggi senatoriali grazie alla mobilitazione dell'elettorato afroamericano. Che cosa comporta questa nuova legge? Innanzitutto conferisce ai funzionari dello Stato l'autorità di appropriarsi dei poteri dei consigli elettorali della Contea, consegnando un potere significativo ai repubblicani che controllano la legislatura statale. Trasforma in reato la fornitura di cibo e acqua agli elettori che attendono in fila per votare, in uno Stato in cui le fila sono notoriamente lunghe, soprattutto in quartieri non bianchi, consente a qualsiasi singolo cittadino georgiano di presentare un numero illimitato di contestazioni all'idoneità di determinati elettori. Impone nuove limitazioni all'uso delle urne elettorali. Crea un hotline antifrode che consente alle persone di lamentarsi in modo anonimo di presunti comportamenti fraudolenti alle urne. La decisione dei repubblicani dello Stato avviene dopo il tentativo dell'ex presidente Trump di fare pressione sui funzionari elettorali della Georgia affinché ribaltassero il risultato delle elezioni presidenziali a lui sfavorevole e dalle affermazioni del presidente repubblicano di diffuse frodi a danno degli elettori durante le elezioni. Ma la legge della Georgia non è la sola che tenta di porre ostacoli al diritto di voto. Secondo il Brennan Center, un istituto appartitico che si occupa proprio di diritto al voto, vi sono attualmente più di 250 disegni di legge in esame nelle legislature statali che limiterebbero l'accesso alle urne, oltre sette volte il numero di disegni di legge restrittivi rispetto all'anno scorso. You like what you see? Well, be sure to like and subscribe so you can always be kept abreast of everything that we've got going on here at The Normal Show. And be sure to join us at thenormalshow.tv. Forse avete perso qualcuno degli episodi recenti, ma non vi preoccupate, li abbiamo raccolti in una versione più lunga. Questo è The Normal Show. Hi, I'm Akio Wingate, and here at The Normal Show, every now and then, we have the opportunity to meet some truly compelling people. Now, today's profile is no different because Giselle Moipo is exactly that, compelling. So, in the segment that follows, we're going to have a nice look at what it takes to bring innovation to the forefront of Africa Tech. This is our profile of Giselle Moipo, and this is also The Normal Show. My name is Giselle Moipo, and I'm the CEO and founder of Okapi Finance International. Okapi is a, a company, a fintech company, that has the mission to bank uh, the unbanked. So, as you know, 80% of people in Africa and um, more than 95% of people in, in the DRC, the, the DR Congo, is financially excluded. So, what we do, we are actually trying to 
accelerate financial inclusion in Africa and in the DRC by uh, creating an ecosystem, a payment ecosystem. Why is it so important now, more than ever, to make something like this a reality? Yeah, it's very important now because uh, what is the reality is that without financial inclusion, the people are kept in poverty. Um, many com countries are focusing to like uh, uh, increase the level of uh, living of the people, but without uh, addressing the issue of financial exclusion, it's almost not possible. Because unbanked people are uh, vulnerable. Unbanked people cannot access uh, the formal uh, financial services like access to credit, which is a key of the development. You know, like the small business, the PME must be able to access uh, credit to be able to develop their business. So the issue of unbanked people is not just uh, uh, focusing to the poor people, even the, the merchants, the, the, the business people in Africa are unbanked, and that is causing a lot of issue today to the society. If you could say one thing to a venture capitalist, to an investor, uh, to pitch them why they should be investing in Kapi and your business, and ultimately investing in African innovation, what would you tell them? Yeah, so if I'll tell one thing to the venture capitalist, is like Africa is uh, the, the next big market. And uh, as the, best, the next big market, it cannot be ignored. You know, you have the market in Africa, which is so huge. I'm telling you, for example, like uh, still 95% of people in DRC are unbanked. DRC is a country of 100 million people. Where do you find that kind of market? It's, it's nowhere. You must like uh, invest in Africa because uh, the, the venture capitalists that are investing today in Africa, they will be in the front line. So when Africa becomes the next uh, emerging market, so the, the, they will be in front line and have been like, uh, they could be able to also do some uh, good royalty uh, investment in, the, in, in Africa. And why investing in Okapi? Because Okapi is addressing, uh, is giving a solution uh, that give uh, access to financial inclusion on a secure way, it's affordable, even the most vulnerable can access the, the solution, and at the same time it's, it's giving as well the flexibility to the people. With a solution which is secure, it, it's um, PCID SS certified, it's uh, following and partnering with like bank, Pan-African bank, so the solution is secure, it's um, uh, compliant to, to Directive 5 for Europe on KYC AML. So really, Okapi is a good venture to invest in because it's addressing a huge is issue, but the issue is, is key for the development of Africa. Where can uh, people watching uh, find out more about Okapi online? Yeah, they can find the about Okapi on the social media Okapi Finance or on the webpage okapifinance.com. Inviateci le vostre storie a hello chiocciola thenormanshow.tv In our C segment, where we go see fantastic destinations, we make the jaunt to not. Nantes is located in the northwest region of France. The nearest beach is 50 kilometers away, and Paris, 342 kilometers away. It boasts a population of 314,148 inhabitants, a surface area of 65 square kilometers, and can be found in the region of Pays de la Loire and the Department of Loire Atlantique. Known for its metallic rings that line the river, a gigantic mechanical elephant, an impressive museum, a stunning cathedral, open green spaces and parks, and a memorial to the enslaved.
Nantes is also a bustling city full of tourists, students, entrepreneurs, retirees, and people of all walks of life. But today we're going to cross the river to a small fishing village known as Trentemoule, known for its multicolored houses and quaint ambiance. The Lille Trentemoule. Trentemoule. Okay, so we're going to take the Navi bus to Trentemoule, which is just across the river from Nantes Central. And we'll be using sort of a boat transportation to get to what was once a fishing village and now they paint the houses with these spectacular colors which you will soon see in two shakes. Si tu fais une comparaison de, de bateau à Venise et ici à Nantes, c'est quoi la différence entre les deux bah, que c'est la mer, c'est plus calme. Où bah, Ici à, à sur la Loire. Ok. So in Venice, the the uh, the sea is is much rougher, and here in Nantes, the sea is not not as rough. It's very calm, according to Marco, for the moment. Um, et au niveau de accessibilité, c'est c'est comment dans ton avis? Accessibilité pour les personnes handicapées et tout ça. Oui, voilà. C'est pareil. C'est le même. So for the so for the people for people who are disabled, it's uh, uh, equal between the two cities. And as you can see, it was very easy getting on the on the boat. And now we're heading to. C'est quoi le nom pour l'île? Trente Mule. After we touched down in Trentemoule, our first stop was a restaurant. In its wee hours of operation, where we could load up on caffeine and a nice cup of coffee. And then we set out and we wandered. Through the multicolored pastel mazes of houses here in Trentemoule. And we wandered. And we wandered. What's magical about Trentemoule is that these pastel facades on each of these lovely houses seems almost par for the course. One might think that you're in a sort of magical village, some otherworldly place where the denizens don't mind tourists who make their way through the back alleys and sidewalks and hidden away niches of this former fishing village. If you do get a chance to make it to Nantes and of course across the river to Trentemoule, by all means, go see the multicolored houses and the gigantic elephant, the lovely works of art at the museum. This was our sea segment in The Normal Show. At The Normal Show, we believe in the power of storytelling. So please send us your stories at hello at thenormalshow.tv. that mean to me? Yes. Oh boy. Well, I have a 
couple of definitions of home. First of all, I have a house in Paris that has been my home for about 45 years. And it's my safe haven, my harbor. I feel really good in my house. Um, I have uh, a little recording studio uh, where I can collaborate with people and create recording songs, demos. Um, it's kind of a haven of peace uh, because it is a house and not an apartment, so my neighbors don't affect me. That's important. That's the definition of my house home. Uh, my original home, I would have to say, is America. Um, even though I've been in France since I was 24 years old, so you probably figure out I'm close to 50, Thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> uh, culturally, I am not French. I speak French. I read in French. I watch French television, French movies, uh, even some French uh, football matches. But um, spiritually, home to me is America, uh, which is very upsetting because I'm extremely pissed off at Donald Trump, and I'm very angry with my fellow Americans for having voted for that jackass. Mm. But whatever it is, it's my my home as well. Mm. So it's it's not. It could be patriotism. When I was a young man, very young man, young and stupid, I, I joined the Marines, and I thought, here I am. I'm, I'm defending this this great country and. Uh, taking a chance with my life. Well, I was a Hollywood Marine. I was stationed in Oceanside, California. It was peacetime, so I have no glory tales to tell, but uh, I feel like I served my country for the amount of time I did, and so that's a part of the spirit of home. <laughs> How did you go from being a Marine to being a journalist? Well, <laughs> I was a journalist first. Um, I studied journalism at the University of Washington, uh, and then I, was, I worked for a daily newspaper in the state of Washington in Bellingham, and then I got a great job in San Francisco uh, with the Associated Press. And, uh, but I was at the age where you had to do military. Every able-bodied American male had to serve, and let's see, uh, out of some kind, but I was able-bodied. And the um, options were going into the Army. Uh, I had applied to the Navy to fly. I applied to the Air Force to fly and uh, the Coast Guard. And I passed the test to be a pilot and they didn't need pilots, it was peacetime. So I said, what the hell? I've got to do something. I might as well see. I might as well join the Marines as, as, an, as a, um, an enlisted man. It was a short term uh, so that I could, uh, after boot camp and after uh, some active duty, I could go back to work as a journalist uh, in, well, it was supposed to be San Francisco, but my, my birth there was, was gone, so they said, well, we, we, we have to keep you on. So they sent me to be a, a journalist in Carson City, Nevada. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the capital, so I was the capital correspondent of the Associated Press, which probably is the reason I'm sitting here in Paris today, because uh, much as um, I like the, the work, seven months in, in um, Car Carson City, um, uh, I, I probably drank more alcohol, and let's just say my, <laughs> my life in Carson City, Nevada, aside from working, was a little crazy, and so I finally said, I gotta get out of here. I really want to be a foreign correspondent, and, and the Associated Press said, well, you're gonna be the next uh, bureau chief, and I said, that's a great honor, but I'm, I don't want to stay in Nevada, and so I quit my job and um, came to Paris, learned French, and got back into the news with the United Press International. Now, fast forward to a completely different life. 
and somehow you got your hands deep in the music industry. Ha. Okay, I come from a family of musicians. My mom was a singer, her brother was a professional musician, my father played the violin, but not, not all that well, but his two brothers were professional musicians. My first cousin was a singer. Uh, I took piano lessons. I'm probably the least talented piano player alive. Uh, I have no talent, but I play just to, to but music was in my blood. Mm -hmm. uh, so while I was working with the United Press International days, I had a radio show on what was then called Radio Luxembourg, RTL now, uh, and my show was uh, called Broadway Champs-Élysées. My job was to interview English-speaking acts, like oh, well, we had quite a few artists that came through. I would interview them in English and then translate it into French, and then I'd play their records. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I worked with a French singer who did the same thing with French artist. Uh, the, the, the French singer was uh, Francois de Gelt, who uh, uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, so we had that show together, and um, I got so interested in music. And then I also um, met an American girl singer who was having a big hit record, and uh, we st I wound up marrying her. Her name was Eileen, and Eileen. Uh, came from a big music business family, and she introduced me to somebody in the music business uh, who right away said, uh, Jack, uh, I'm looking for a, a professional manager for my, my company in Paris. Would that interest you? And I thought, what's the, you know, what, what is it? And so he said, come to London and we'll explain it to you. So I took a train over to London, or plane over to London, what am I talking about? Uh, and sat down in this office and they said, well, we just signed this group. It's called the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I said, I think, wow. And we also signed a group called Who. Um, and I'll, so you would have to be sort of representing these people when they come to town. You go see them. You're our representative. And go see the radio stations and talk about the Rolling Stones and the Who. And all. I said, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I quit after practically seven years as a journalist, I just overnight got myself involved in the music business. And, um, oh, it's a very long story. <laughs> uh, I learned studio techniques, recording techniques, and um, I started producing records. And they, strangely enough, became hit records. And, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to say some names. Well, you, I, say, you say the first word that comes to you. I'm going to say some names to you, okay? Yeah. I'm just going to say some random names. Okay. Not so random, but random names. Okay. And the first word that comes to you, Martin Habib. Okay. Martin Habib was discovered by the person who taught me everything I know about the, the studio business, Georges Chatelain, who created the, Europe's first multi-track studio, right? Everybody was stuck at four tracks, and then Chatelain built an eight-track studio. Then he built a 16-track, then he built a 32, with his partner, Bernard Estavi. And um, they taught me the tricks of recording, and I taught them a big lesson, because they, they, were, they were producing a, an artist named Gilles, Marta, Ma, uh, Gilles, uh, Gilles Marchat, and they, they produced a record, that, which they put out in December, and it was called Le Père Noël et Mort, which is terrific marketing. Uh, so I said to them, it's not going to happen. And they said, oh yeah, well, what do you know? So I said, well, I'm a music publisher now, and I started bringing them hit. Mm -hmm. But our first big, big, big hit was a, um, a duet with Gilles Marchal, and this girl who had a voice very much like Joan Baez, and she was a friend of Joan Baez, a French girl, Martine Habib. And Martine had a glorious voice, and she played guitar. And um, so we, we, we looked for a song, and we found Summer of Wine, which was written by Lee Hazelwood, mm -hmm. who, whom I knew. And um, Lee Hazelwood went on to write, uh, These Boots Are Made For Walking, and, 
tons of stuff with Nancy Sinatra and even Frank Sinatra. Uh, but um, going back again, Martine, um, we had a hit with Summer Wine, this duet, and the next thing you know, we got a contract with uh, Clive Davis mm. in uh, America to do an album in Nashville. Give us your easiest combination of making a hit. What do you put together to make a hit? Um, number one, a great song. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that the first step is your basic rhythm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it's just a, a simple guitar or guitar, bass, and drums. The track has to move. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it's a slow song or a fast song. Or, you know, it just has to make people uh, move with it. Uh, those are the two elements I say, God, you can't, you can spend millions uh, if you don't have a great song. It's the same thing as a, as a movie. You can spend millions and have the biggest stars you want. You're not going to bring people into the theater or you, you're not going to make people buy uh, records if the song isn't there. 